Thank you for joining us from across the Commonwealth. The destiny of the Commonwealth is in the hands of the next generation. Of the 2.4 billion Commonwealth citizens, over 60% are under the age of 30. Not only are young people the majority, they are also demonstrating the way of the future, taking action on the most pressing issues of our time, from gender equality to racial justice and climate change. In collaboration with the Queen's Commonwealth Trust and the Commonwealth Youth Council, this third event in the Commonwealth Foundation's Critical Conversations event series puts young people's desires at the heart of discussions about the Commonwealth's legacy and more importantly, its future. What big lessons have been learned from recent activism around racial justice and climate change? How can Commonwealth institutions support youth movements that are pushing for change and help them to deliver more? How can we help shape our Commonwealth so that it becomes a leading force for a better world. We are asking our speakers to share ideas about what is important, what must change, and what support they need to lead the Commonwealth into the future. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, and thank you for joining this critical conversation. Greetings and welcome to today's critical conversation. We are really happy to have you with us and it's great to see that people from across the Commonwealth really know how to enter a room. Everyone comes in, says their name and says where they're from. So we know we have people from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Namibia, Kenya, Vancouver Island, Spain. You're coming in from all over the world and we are really pleased to have you here with us. Today we will be talking about the Commonwealth and some parts of it are conversations that we don't have often enough. And we're going to take you through a journey. We're gonna start at the very beginning with the past. We're gonna move through and talk about what young people are doing today, right now, all throughout the Commonwealth to create a better world. And then we're going to talk about future making, which is one of the most exciting things that we can talk about because we know that young people have the power and the energy to bring to making the Commonwealth a more equitable place. And now our panelists will reveal themselves to you so that you can say hello to them and they'll give you a wave. And we're gonna jump right in, starting with the past. But before we do that, I want to encourage you to keep using the chat, have your conversations there. But if you have questions that you'd like to pose to the panelists or any comments that you'd like to have read, please use the question and answer function. You should be able to see that at the bottom of your screen. Kavindia, I'd like to pose the first question to you because you made a very powerful action when you wrote an open letter to the Commonwealth and it got a lot of attention. The Queen's Commonwealth Trust picked it up and they published it and it started a lot of work within the QCT. Why did you think that it was important to write this letter talking about the Commonwealth and the way that Commonwealth institutions need to reckon with the past and admit to some of the things that happened, a lot of the past atrocities, why was that important to you? And how do you see that as useful in moving us forward? Yeah, uh, thank you, Alicia. And it's so great to be among uh, friends and colleagues. Um, I think uh, going back to the letter, I was actually reading through the letter this morning. Um, I think I initially kind of penned this, um, I think, you were also part of this like initial group when, you know, this is just, I think, a, a Twitter thread that then got picked up um, uh, at a kind of a group that a few of the Commonwealth colleagues were having um, from the Queen's Young Leaders program. And uh, what happened was I was scrolling through the Commonwealth website and uh, I came across Sri Lanka because you have kind of a um, bio for each member country. And then I saw that 1948, which was the year that we gained independence from the British, was written as the, the year that Sri Lanka joined the Commonwealth. And then I started digging through some of the material. Um, I F searched for the words colonial, imperial, um, and I found like two searches. And I think this was kind of the beginning. Um, I think early last year, uh, starting to dig into some of this material and really understanding how did the Commonwealth talk about its colonial past? Um, how were we acknowledging it? How were we making sense of it? Uh, because I think we consider ourselves to be a part of the Commonwealth as, as supposed as as people who um, are not just a part of it in a passive way, but people 
who have ownership over the Commonwealth, because I guess we're always told we are the Commonwealth. And then I realized if we are the Commonwealth, then we need to have a say in terms of how our history is spoken about. Of, um, So then I reached out to a couple of people um, like Francis Brown, I think was on the call today. Um, and, I, and I also, I think um, Alicia, you also part of those initial conversations of saying, all right, what do we do now? Um, and that's how the letter came about uh, that sparked on a lot of conversations within the Commonwealth. And I think there were three quick demands. It was rethink the website. And if you go to the website now, you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. Like if you wanna go now and F search it, you can do it. Um, and I think now there have been conversations this year, which is great. So I think you might have more than two searches for the words colonial or imperial. Um, and the second thing was having more people from the Commonwealth countries in the boards, in the trustees, uh, trustee boards and people in decision-making power and not just passive recipients. Uh, so those are some of the calls to action on the letter. So I think that's, that's how it all started, um, at least for me um, and exploring this space. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing that and for taking the lead and you're right, we, we are the Commonwealth, right? And I think a lot of times we think about institutions as being above us and being responsible for making all of the change, but we actually have to agitate for that change. And you took that first step that's led to bringing people together to have more conversations about this and making particular demands. So I'm really interested to hear from you, Darian, about how you see this taking shape in the Caribbean, are people having conversations right now about um, the Commonwealth, about its past, about the present, the way that it's affecting life right now within the region? Thanks so much for that question, Alicia. And let me say, uh, first of all, uh, pleasant good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody across the Commonwealth who's here, who's joining on this call. I'm so happy to be here with you all and I'm so happy to be included here. This is an excellent move in the right direction. So I wanted to make sure and say that up front and these honest discussions need to be happening. So I'm glad that you're talking about, about the Caribbean because um, I think the Caribbean has, has been a, a, a big pusher uh, over the last decade or so uh, for, you know, for, for really um, revamping and revising the way in which the Commonwealth is approached and the manner in which the, the Commonwealth is thought about. You know that the reparations movement is a massive movement that is happening globally currently but it's also coming out of the University of the West Indies, which is a Caribbean based university, specifically catering towards the needs of the Commonwealth Caribbean um, and well then the wider Caribbean and everybody else, of course, but it, it, it is um, formed, it was formed by the Commonwealth Caribbean nations. Um, so, so I'm so happy that we have that uh, being put at the front of the agenda and, and what is basically asking, of course, is for everything um, that has happened to us in our past, all the, uh, the economic turmoil, all the problems that we faced for some sort of monetary compensation to be given to that, to basically restart and revise and revamp the manner in which these governments operate. Because what we have inherited is, of course, a series of issues and problems um, that has come from, from, of course, our colonial past that has been left, that colonial legacy, and it continues to sustain the very fabric upon which we walk and which we operate within all our countries. And this is not only uh, just specific to the Caribbean region, but across the board. And we've seen it in so many different ways and in so many different manners. In fact, uh, many people oftentimes say, and, and they told me that, to be honest in these conversations, that when the colonial powers left, they made sure and left, they left the countries more divided than it was beforehand. So they ensured that there was no stability when they were exiting these countries. And, and we're looking at it from, from economic perspectives, from political perspectives. And we have been facing and battling those issues currently to this day. Uh, you know, in, in the Caribbean, we have several countries who, who gained their independence in the 1960s. We had Jamaica and then we had Trinidad and Tobago in 1962. Um, and basically we, we still see the effects of, of, that, of, that, um, of the colonial power and what, what they would have done in terms of our political structures and how they would have structured it and the issues that we have facing it now currently. Um, one of the things that I oftentimes say, and this is my last point here this year before I hand over to you, is that 
we've inherited a, a lot of policies and a lot of structures from the governments of, of uh, from the UK government specifically, right? Um, that, that colonial power that we speak of. And those structures culturally, uh, I don't think works effectively and efficiently for our political systems here within the Caribbean region, as well as across the globe. Whenever I look at political structures and systems, I'm like, but this, this, this yes, this would work in a European context, but within our own context, within our own regions, within our own areas, I don't think that it works and that it functions very well. And that maybe we need to, to even look, take a look and a deep dive back into our legislation and our legislative, legislative policies and, and, um, and our, our laws that govern us across, across the globe and our political structures and really look at revamping and revitalizing those to match our culture and our structures that we have and, and our on the ground experiences as well. Thank you so much for that. And we're definitely going to talk a lot more about policy and legislation and the need for reform very shortly. Before we get there though, I'd love to bring you in Nandumiso to talk about what you talk about often, which is culture and the fact that culture is not static and that it changes with people, people change culture, but also having this balance between modernity and tradition. Could you talk a little bit about that and how you are doing that work and how you're encouraging others to do that work, particularly in a post-colonial or neo-colonial society? Thank you so much, Alicia, for letting me pop into the conversation. And I'd like to say hi to everybody who's joined us around the world, it seems. Um, culture is a very, very interesting topic. I, I come from a beautiful kingdom in, in Southern Africa, the kingdom of Eswatini, also known as Swaziland. And it's, it's something that we've always seen as rooting us. Um, we, we have paired it with our traditions and our customs. But when we look at society, culture isn't meant to be static. What we did previously and how we lived in previous times isn't how we live today. And it certainly won't be an indication of how we live tomorrow. So the question then becomes, how do we make sure that we're staying true to ourselves while respecting our traditions and values and our culture while also adapting to the modernity? And I think for me, that's rooted in value. And that will apply across many lines. Um, at the end of the day, we may come from different places within the Commonwealth. We have 54 states. We are equal in status on paper in terms of our charter. We occupy a fifth of the land area. And we're a third of the world's population. More importantly, closer to home, 94% of the Commonwealth live in Asia and Africa. And there's certain values that you can ascribe to all of us that, that, that want and that need for recognition, for respect, for understanding, and for the ability to progress and to make the world better than what we found it should unify us. And I think those are the things that um, I like to highlight in everything that I do and the work that I do. Um, regardless of where we're coming from, what traditions we adhere to, what belief systems we follow, um, whether we feel like we are uh, fully participating in this modern world or we want to stick um, to our, our, our um, core values or our core systems as we found them, I think at the base of it, there needs to be an understanding of moving in a future or towards building a future where we all come together to make this commonwealth one that respects, one that values, and one that promotes uh, a unified way of moving forward as one. On the topic of respecting and promoting unity, I'd like to bring Lance in at this point. Lance, earlier, Kavi and Darian both talked about the past and Darian brought up reparations. And as an indigenous leader, can you share with us some of the values within your community and the way that you go about reconciliation? How do you, how do you repair relationships and how do you reconcile? Do you have processes for that, that perhaps 
the rest of the Commonwealth can learn from. Well, thank you for that question. And thank you for having me on your um, part of your panel today. And I think that's a really important question. You know, in Canada, we're undergoing a process of reconciliation between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And this is something that has really been highlighted by um, our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, the importance of that, you know, that crown and that Indigenous people, that nation to nation relationship. Um, so what we're doing in Canada um, from an Indigenous perspective is we're really focusing on education, you know, ensuring that our non-Indigenous counterparts are aware of, you know, what I would say is the true history of Canada, which is, you know, built on colonialism. And, you know, we as Indigenous people have endured a lot of things in this country, um, you know, as recent as 1996, some of you might know about the residential school system, which, you know, was a system in place here in Canada where it took um, Indigenous children from their communities and put them into, you know, schools for the purposes of re-education. So, you know, that aspect of our history is something that's being taught and that's something that, you know, is now being highlighted in the curriculum in our school. So, you know, ensuring that the next generation of Canadians is aware of the history of this country, um, but also knows, you know, the steps that need to be taken to ensure that, you know, Indigenous people are included in this country in the political and social and economic systems of Canada. So, you know, what I'm seeing now is really exciting. You know, we're seeing Indigenous people being elected to our legislatures. They're being able to um, influence the policy and legislation of this country. Um, we have Indigenous people sitting around boardrooms in, you know, a corporate setting, being able to influence the country that way. You know, we are making a lot of headway when it comes to the inclusion of Indigenous people, um, education on our history, and advancing the promise of reconciliation. But, you know, it's important to recognize that we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and I think that work starts with young people like ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Lance. We have quite a few questions already coming in. Remember those who are viewing in within Zoom, you can use the question and answer function to share your questions, but also use the chat for other general commentary. So I'm gonna to go to one of the questions that we have here from David Spence. In what ways are young people working with older people to collaborate on visioning the Commonwealth of the future? Any of our speakers? Darian, would you like to speak to that? Sure, not a problem. Um, so I think that this, this is something that's very crucial. I think one of the issues that we have sometimes as young people, and I'm gonna be very honest here, is that um, we have the passion, we have the desire, we have the drive, but sometimes in, in executing our duties and, and in going out to challenge sitting forces out there, and those, those forces need to be challenged, please, by all means, don't get me wrong. But I think one of the issues that we sometimes, that we sometimes forget in the process of doing so is consultation. And consultation should ultimately come uh, from somebody with experience who, who would have probably walked a, a, a road or a path similar to this before. Um, and whether what, what, that, what that advice is that comes your way, whether it is right or wrong, because right? it can be right and it can be wrong, or it can be suited to what you're doing or not suited to what you're doing. At the end of the day, you would have the understanding of that experience that has gone before. So you would, you would be able to then garner from them um, further information to properly structure your plan going forward. I don't think that everything can just be done on a, on a whim and fancy. Of course, some things in the moment, yes, you would, you know, the passion is there, the emotion is there, you have the opportunity, you take the strike, yeah, but it cannot always be that way. We must have a, a, a process to follow up that. So if we have a certain level of activism that comes with, with all the passion and we, 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 um, we challenge, et cetera, we should make sure that we then have a team of, and, and, and people could work in different, in different areas as well, right? Um, so what I'm saying is that, yes, you have that, that first initial force challenging, but you need to have a team afterwards who does consultation with the older, with older people, people who have, who, have, um, who have experience, people who have written uh, uh, articles and, and people who have walked the walk, who have been involved in activist movements, because they will understand the, the memory, um, the institutional memory of, of the organization. They will have an understanding of that. And then we can draw on that as well. We can pull from that so that we don't end up in a cycle and that's one of the issues and one of the concerns that I have, that we just end up in a cycle of battling the same issues over and over and over because we don't take from the past or learn from our past. 
in order to then better propel ourselves forward into the future. So I see it as being an, an essential part of, of it. Um, whether, whether they will always be right, <laughs> I don't think they will always be right, because you have some things that, that really just the young people will have uh, different innovative ideas and concepts, but I do think that they have a very valuable contribution in terms of the experience that they bring to the table. And it's important that we, we listen. We need to listen before we act, before we speak as well. So I, I always suggest listening as much as possible to, to all the people, to the generations before us. Listen to them and, and don't challenge them almost immediately. Give them your opportunity to speak, to talk, and just take that time to listen. And then afterwards, offer your rebuttals, et cetera, um, inside there. But make sure that every interaction that you have with somebody who is a past a generational leader, generational activist, et cetera, that you learn and that you draw from their experiences so that we do not make the same mistakes going forward. Really excellent point, Starion. And I'd like to bring in Kakembo at this point because you've been doing such innovative work with waste energy and working with young people. Have you found ways to engage in intergenerational dialogue and to expand your work by involving people of different generations? Uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, yes, uh, when we look at uh, intergenerational dialogue or cooperation, uh, it's really important to, to emphasize what uh, Darion has said that um, as youth, we need to understand that uh, the generations before us have a wealth of knowledge, right? And they have built this wealth of knowledge out of practice, experience, uh, hardships. And so we have to welcome their ideas first. Yes, as you mentioned, we have to challenge, um, but we have to sit back and first get to listen, first get to understand what they, they're emphasizing and then offer our opinion. And after offering an opinion, then we come together and find a common ground. So um, for example, within my project, uh, the West to Energy Youth Project, uh, when we were starting, we had to involve uh, our professors at the university, we had to involve uh, different commissioners and ministries and different uh, people who run already existing energy projects. So that we get their ideas and perspectives of how we can get funding or how we can scale up such projects or even just how we can avoid um, doing the mistakes they already made and make better choices. So this defined the, the direction in which our project was going. And this helped us, uh, it kind of shortened our, our time that would take to scale because we already knew what not to do. And we already knew what parts might have better odds or better chances of success. So uh, I still, uh, agree with Darion that we have to have those fights, yes, but then let us first listen and let us first take note and pick out what we can and then modify and then do better. So what you and Darion are really talking about is learning from people who have already been doing the work and then being able to build on that, right? And I think this is a great time to bring you in, Emmanuel, um, because we have a question that I think is perfect for you. Uh, coming in from Sumaya. And the question is, as a young leader, how do we bring about change given that it is a difficult process? How is the Commonwealth organization assisting young people to actively participate in curbing this issue? I think with your experience and your previous role at Kaleidoscope Trust with working with different organizations all over the Commonwealth, I think you're well placed to give some insight. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I just want to start by saying my name is Emmanuel and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I also wanted to begin by just stating really outrightly my privileged positionality of being born in the UK. Um, I hold a British passport and it is not um, 
I, my identity as a queer woman is not criminalized. So even as I engage in these conversations, um, I just wanted to start by saying that my ability to bring about change is uh, from a position of, of relative privilege, um, given the context that I live in. Um, in the UK right now, uh, we have um, a, a, a scandal to, to do with the fact that many people don't hold British passports um, from people being um, forced to be deported back to um, countries because they are homeless, for example. So I just wanted to really start by saying that my ability to affect change is, um, is from a position of power. And that is really important when I consider um, the change that we're able to do across the Commonwealth. Um, my background with regard to my experience in the Commonwealth comes from uh, my experience of being part of the Commonwealth Equality Network, where we were um, fighting for member states to currently criminalize homosexuality to abolish those laws. So currently 34 of 54 member states criminalize homosexuality. And I think it's really important to note that the very existence of these laws come from the colonial period. So when we talk about colonialism in the context of the Commonwealth, you know, these, these aren't just theoretical issues, they have real impact on people's lives and people's ability to live their lives safely and freely. Um, that said, my experience of the Commonwealth Equality Network just goes to show that the Commonwealth has, you know, has a role to play in, in uh, creating and, and bringing about change. I saw um, just through uh, being a part of TISA and the Commonwealth Equality Network, how it brought together activists to actually advocate for change at a level where they, it may not have been possible for them to do so at the country level. So for example, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting that takes place every two years is a place where Commonwealth member states can bring uh, their parliamentarians um, to the general public, um, to Commonwealth accredited organizations, to a space where they can advocate for change. And you can have you know, someone from um, the Bahamas, for example, this year, uh, speaking to um, an, a parliamentarian in Sri Lanka, and that dialogue might be more effective perhaps than uh, Sri Lankan activists being able to actually advocate to um, their own um, their own MP. Um, but in terms of uh, like how the Commonwealth can assist young people, I think one thing that we we struggle to bring to the conversation, and I I really respect that we have been able to 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 talk about um, uh, reconciliation and talk about um, reparations, but I would really want to see that conversation happen at the Commonwealth level. What would it actually mean for the Commonwealth Charter, for example, to have a statement that said that they accept or they recognize and they apologize for the harms of colonialism? We haven't actually seen a tangible recognition and acceptance of that violence. You know, we've had that we had Theresa May, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, um, express a statement of regret for colonial era laws that mean that uh, many Commonwealth member states still criminalize homosexuality, but without that additional acknowledgement of apology, how do we actually form, form a way to, um, you know, bring, um, bring in funding that isn't just on, on limited cycles of, you know, Every, you know, Theresa May, sorry, to be more precise, Theresa May, when she issued her statement of regret, she um, promised uh, a set of funding to support in Commonwealth member states um, trying to abolish these uh, colonial era laws. But, you know, even our cycles of, um, of, of finance that we find ourselves in still tie countries to um, aid that isn't necessarily going to, be, going to bring about the radical change that we hope it might be. So I think for me, it's really important to bring to the table a complete reimagination of the Commonwealth as we know it. What would it actually mean to, to discuss abolition um, and to bring this to the table, to genuinely organize around these kind of radical demands? Um, and I think, and I hope that that is the, the, the change that young people are, um, are demanding at the moment. So many great points. And for people who are wondering about this, this funding that was made available after the statement of regret by Theresa May, you can look up the Equality and Justice Alliance because that was sort of a coalition that formed with a number of organizations that were providing technical assistance to Commonwealth governments that were interested in reforming laws, particularly that were discriminatory against women, girls, and LGBT people. But of course that's limited because those countries, those governments needed to opt in. They had to already have interest 
in, in making those, those legislative changes. So really excellent points, Emanuela, thank you so much. I wanna to go to another question because there are so many questions coming in and they're all such great questions. This one is from Wisdom Banda and it is, how best can we advocate for young people to be involved in the decision-making process? And I'd love to hear from Kavi about this. Um, thank you. Um, I think that's always such an excellent question because I think um, I think this whole uh, conversation of youth engagement, I think started at least maybe about a decade ago. And I think it took a few years almost for us to really understand what was it, how did it look like to engage young people in a meaningful way? And I think the way we even talk about it of engaging young people as if we are this kind of monolith of people, um, I think is, uh, is something that we've all struggled with because a lot of us come from our own areas of expertise. Um, um, Manuel and Darian, Alicia and all of us here and Kakembo, um, we come from our own areas of expertise, whether it's law, whether it's education, design, technology. And when we are taken into spaces, sometimes the, the expertise that we come from is kind of erased and we're simply engaged for, for our age. And I think that's where we miss the point where the intentions are very noble of wanting us to be heard and our voices to be included in the conversation. But I think what we need right now is for that process to be more, made more intentional. We are bringing in young people with the needed level of expertise for that particular topic. So for instance, if you're talking about education, there's no point in engaging young people who have done so much work in environment and you're having the people who have expertise in education in that environmental conversation. And then you suddenly say, oh, well, young people are not really bringing in tangible insights. Like these are not workable. They don't have the knowledge that they need because we're simply trying to find somebody between the age of like 17 to 25, 30 and just put them into the conversation. And that really doesn't get us anywhere. Um, and I think we've all faced this as sometimes we go into a panel or a conversation or a consultation and our name is just young person. And that completely raises the years of work that we have, because I strongly believe that experience does come from as Darren really uh, well put together of years of experience in a particular topic. But it also, I think, comes from the quality of these experiences that you had and the quality of the engagements you've had. So I think it, it really depends on how that engagement happens and if you have the power to influence a decision making. There's no point in listening to us. If you're going to listen to us and put it in a nice blog post and forget about it. There needs to be a place that we need to have a seat on the table or we need to be allowed to create our own table. Um, if, if the current table doesn't have enough seats um, to be given the resources to kind of bring our own seats and create our own table. Um, so I think that's kind of uh, where I come into it from. Uh, but I think Noni also wanted to uh, add in. Um, Alicia, back to you. Nondemiso, did you want to jump in here? I'm happy for you to, to contribute here. Sure, I just wanted to, to build on what Kavi was saying because there is this really, really, really concerning um, trend, I would say, um, to use youth as a way of representing change, but it's not meaningful. Um, and I think speaking to, to the question that came in, I think how do we create change that's permanent, that's lasting? Um, and just speaking from my own experience, moving from a, a space of social activism and realizing that, you know, marching and, and demanding change wasn't enough. I actually had to do the groundwork and look at the different laws, as Manuel was saying, and, and really advocate for policy changes. Um, and it's, it's, it's hard work to do, um, echoing what Kavi said, especially coming in uh, with this aura of young person, what do they have to add to the conversation? Um, and, and it can be quite daunting, but one thing I would want to add is, um, regardless of the fact that people are trying to tick a box where they're trying to include you for tokenism's sake, whatever space you're given, make the most of that opportunity and, and go far above and beyond um, to make an impact. I would say, forget the table. I would say some of us won't even have seats. We'll have to bring our own chairs and there won't even be a table and we'll just have to sit in a round 
um, circle with one another and, and ask that uh, we are not only given the space, but that we take up the space, that we're not only given the opportunity to be in the room, but sometimes we found our ways to invite ourselves to said room and making the contributions that are necessary for our demographic, for lack of a better word, to be heard. We have to contribute in terms of mandates beyond just filling a quota. We have to seek out making real tangible changes and, and shifting the spheres of influence in our favor by rather than seeing the opportunities that are there that were given permission to partake in and really seeing the opportunities to create spaces where they don't even know that opportunities need to be created. So both of you are talking a lot about looking at youth in a very tokenistic way, right? So there's a way that youth has become a sort of currency. And I'm really interested in hearing from you about how you use this to your advantage without in turn being used just for your youth. How do you, how do you take advantage of the access that you have to these spaces because of your youth, but then bring the expertise and actually challenge the people who are inviting you to those spaces? Kakambo, could you speak to that about challenging that idea of, of your youth just as a token? Uh, thank you, Alicia. Well, I've been in these situations very many times, um, and uh, w especially in, uh, I would be bl blunt to say in African countries, uh, youth are brought onto the table, not because uh, they, were, they actually want to know their opinions or hear their voices, but uh, most cases just to tick a box um, because the international community says so. Uh, so you find that when you approach the table, your suggestions or your opinions don't really uh, count that much. And so you have to find a way to get hard. Yeah. So one of the ways I have been able to maneuver around such um, obstacles is that I tend to use the platform that they give me to network. Yeah, if they, if for example, a, a minister or someone in government tells me, okay, you can go attend this conference because, well, they say you need youth on the team. I will go to that conference. I will get there. I'll get to the table. I'll get the right connections. I will talk to everyone there. I'll make myself seen. I'll make myself heard. And I will use those connections later on to actually feed into the projects that I'm doing back home, right? It might not be uh, a project linked to, to the conference that I traveled for, but it will, I will use that connection eventually. So uh, this is to speak to the fact that yes, these challenges exist, but like, uh, uh, like Noni said, let's, try to use that chance that you've been given that space. Make use of it, yeah? You make the connections, make the networks, get the assets, and then uh, make meaningful change with it. Thank you, Kakambo. And I know, Emmanuel, you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to also, just to build on what everyone else is saying, that it's certainly from the, a, a my perspective of being in the global north is that or quote unquote global north is that even the understanding of who gets considered a youth is not straightforward i'm reminded of the fact that tamir rice was 12 years old when he was shot by police in in cleveland ohio to the fact that um, vanessa nakate a uh, ugandan climate activist was literally cut out of a picture of greta thunberg and other white youth um in a climate activist uh, picture yeah, the the concept of who gets to be a youth is already uh, wrapped up in white supremacy and capitalism. So I think on the one hand, yeah, we have to obviously, you know, really take on this, this identity of youth and use it for really important purposes. But even who gets to be, who gets to be kind of put under that, that wing of, of youth is not straightforward. And it's, it's, yeah, it's something that we need to complicate and push against as well. 
we're also getting some similar questions about gender equality and how we can include women in ways that are not tokenistic. So I think there are a lot of conversations happening about radical inclusion. Um, Lance, can you jump in here and, and talk a little bit about how we can include people who have been historically and still today marginalized and, and kept outside of these spaces? Certainly, thank you for that question. Um, indigenous women were disenfranchised for years and um, did not have the right to vote here in Canada up until the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, even before that, up until the um, 1990s here in Canada, if an Indigenous woman, a First Nations woman married a uh, non-Indigenous man, she would lose her status and would not be entitled to, um, you know, the benefits that being um, of holding that status with the government, what that entails and what that provides. Um, but what we have seen recently in Canada, and particularly among Indigenous politics, is a um, resurgence, I would say, of women being elected to um, these positions of influence within our political spheres. Um, even in my region here in the province of Ontario, um, the top Indigenous leader, which is the Ontario Regional Chief, in 2018, Roseanne Archibald became the first woman to be elected to that position. Um, and before that, we're seeing at the community level, uh, women are being elected as chiefs, which is, you know, like a um, mayor of a town. So we're seeing that we're seeing, um, you know, increasing numbers of women uh, who are being elected to these roles who are doing the hard work of, you know, leadership, and we're seeing real results. And I think, you know, the importance of um, having women in leadership and in, in these positions, um, it's not just about equality, it's not just about symbolism. But what I've noticed is when you, you know, when women are in these positions, they approach things differently. They approach, um, you know, dealing with these challenges from a, a holistic viewpoint in a different way than, you know, um, a man would. Not to, you know, discount the leadership of men, but, you know, it's important that we get women, especially Indigenous women and women around the Commonwealth, um, sitting at these tables and being part of these decisions and, you know, contributing their voices to these important discussions. We've definitely seen the benefits of, of women in leadership, particularly around the management of the pandemic, right? There's been so many articles and so much conversation about the way that women leaders are handling the pandemic so much better and being more holistic, like you're saying, Lance, in, in the response and ensuring that people are taken care of during this period. And to the point on women in leadership, Darion, I'm gonna to come to you because there have been quite a number of general elections held recently within the Caribbean, and there are a lot of conversations going on about women who are in positions of leadership as well as having quotas. Can you talk a little bit about how you've seen this, this sort of growth of women in leadership and what that is actually looking like in terms of not just numbers, but the quality of leadership? So thanks so much for that again, Alicia. Um, so several things I, I want to bring to the, to the forefront first. Let me just backtrack a little bit um, to the whole idea as well of, of youth as, as currency, and then I will come up into this. My discussion will include this aspect around gender as well. So really quickly, um, I think one of the issues that we have as, as youth entering into spaces is that we don't identify our privilege, right? And I see privilege as being something that we need to identify almost immediately because there are a lot of young people who claim to represent a lot of other young people and, and groups of young people across the entire Commonwealth. And they have not even interacted with different class groups within there. And that is extremely problematic. You cannot as a privileged individual, not recognizing your privilege, not having any connections, any grassroots organizations, go into a boardroom at policy level and policy making, making levels, and then say, you know what, I am going to speak on behalf of these people. And that is so problematic. And I think that is something that needs to be addressed almost immediately when we're talking about currency of young people. If you want that currency to have true value, then we need to make sure that that, that inclusivity and means also having strong and, and purposeful connections with grassroots organizations who are doing the actual work on the ground. Because very often as well, a lot of these policies that come out of these high level meetings are so technocratic and the jargon is not understandable by the average individual on the street. And we have to be very careful with that. If we are claiming to be who we are, 
as young leaders going into spaces and representing the, the cause and the case for people who exist in all different class brackets across the entire Commonwealth, we need to ensure that one, we identify our privileges, and two, that we're also very connected to the grassroots level organizations out there. Coming up now to the, to the discussion that we're having around, of course, gender equality. And again, this, this comes back to why I wanted to backtrack a little bit, because it's the identification of a privilege as well entering into any space, especially as a young person. It is far more difficult for a young woman right, to enter into a space filled with, with, with um, men with patriarchal systems in place in the, in the policy making decisions, et cetera, and for their voice to be heard and for their voice to speak out. So it's important that we as young men, the young men and youth, youth leaders who are male, recognize that privilege almost immediately that we have entering into a space. And we have to be the, vo the voice of change in regards to that as well, in collaboration and working in contingent with, the, with, with women who are in the leadership space, in the youth leadership space. It cannot be any one, one uh, gender pushing ahead or trying to say, you know, oh, this, is, this is what it is and this is what it is. The empowerment must come at all levels and from every single, um, and from every single, single gender existing within this space as well, because everybody needs to have an equal and inclusive voice. Now, coming to the, to the question I was just asked there this year, you spoke about um, women in leadership. And when we see women entering into the space of political leadership within the Caribbean region, what we have seen is actually a whole new dimension entering into the political sphere and space, right? That is because there are many things that have not been speak, spoken about by, um, by men for years prior within this space that now women are bringing to the forefront. So it's a whole different perspective. And we see that being so important inside there as well. So because very often as well within the Caribbean region, within a, a lot of these countries, we have a higher female population than, than, than male. And it's important that, that, but it's not reflective within our political systems. And we must ask ourselves, what, what is the reason for that? And why is that happening? And it is because we, we still exist within this, within this whole idea of, a, of, of the, the, patriarch, the patriarchal rule and patriarchal power that needs to be revamped and revised and changed so that we can have more inclusivity of women inside there. And so that those new and brighter and stronger perspectives can be brought to the forefront as well. And I see that as being so essential. Now, um, one of my favorite prime ministers within the Caribbean region is Mia Motley, right? The Honorable Mia Motley from Barbados. I love her, love her so much, right? She's an amazing prime minister. I've, I've had the privilege of sitting in a meeting with her and I've seen her present everything and the way how she holds her own is amazing. And, and in fact, dare I say she's one of the strongest prime ministers in the region right now, currently. Right, and she has been doing excellent work in terms of her policy making, and we've seen how she's been holding her own against everybody else within the Caribbean, and, and so much so that sometimes you have people saying that she's the Caribbean's prime minister, right? <laughs> which is which is something that's really interesting inside there as well. But we see that that once we have the opportunities open up, and that we have women entering into the spaces and combating the, the, the patriarchal system that exists, we see movements in the right direction and growth of our region, of our countries, et cetera, as well. Thank you, Darian. Um, so we're talking a lot about moving away from tokenism and having real inclusion and actually involving the people that we engage or that institutions engage. But let's shift a little bit and talk about what we want to see Commonwealth institutions do about that. We're talking a lot kind of in general and about what we ourselves can do. And Darian, you raised a great point about recognizing your privilege. And I think Emmanuel actually did that extremely well, you know, before she even answered her first question. So that was an excellent example of, of what you're talking about. Um, but Kavi, I'm going to come to you about the real and tangible and very precise things that we want to see from Commonwealth institutions that they can model and that we would also like to see governments do to include people. Yeah. In um, yeah, I think um, it's a, I come from a design background. Um, I'm a designer by profession. Um, I always think of this, how do we have a design mindset to thinking about what does change actually look like? Um, and something we do in the design space is called backward design. So what that simply means is we envision what success looks like at the end whether it's a, it's a conference or conversation, um, a process like what we're going through right now with the Commonwealth, we envision what does success look at, like at the end? What are we thinking? How does that change look like? Um, how do we measure that change? And really have a really good visual of what that change looks like. 
And for me, when kind of we wrote that letter and then we started this whole series of conversations, especially within the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, um, one of the big ideas uh, that really helped me was really envisioning what that change looked like. And for me, it's a couple of very tangible things. And I try to envision that as what does change look like next week? What would change look like in the next six months, the next year, and in the next five years? And to really face it out well. And for me, kind of those one year clear outcomes, at least within the Commonwealth of how not only uh, do we acknowledge um, kind of this colonial past, um, have uh, get rid of these very tokenistic ways of engaging young people and really create that space of inclusivity that we've been talking about. I think for me, one of the things is really revisiting our websites. Like it's something very basic, but to just do a website audit and see, like if you go to the Commonwealth website now, you, you can clearly see what I'm talking about. Do a website audit, revisit how we're talking about the Commonwealth. What is that member state blurb look like? How are we talking about Sri Lanka? How are we talking about India? How are we talking about the Caribbean nations? And to allow uh, people from these nations to write about their own country's colonial past and how this talk talked about in the Commonwealth, kind of the public facing material. So that would be one. And I think the second thing is to really revisit the boards, uh, the boards of trustees, um, directors, um, and also employees um, at all the different Commonwealth institutions and to really understand how many are coming actually from the Commonwealth nations. How many are women? How many um, non-binary folk are included in these conversations? And to really do an audit. Because else, if you don't understand the problem, it's hard for us to come up with a solution. Because they're kind of moving through like a dark room, not figuring out what to do. So that will be the second thing. And I think for me, the third tangible change is there's a lot of grant making that happens to the Commonwealth, a lot of money that is kind of going out into the Commonwealth nations. Um, I like to say that it's kind of reimbursement of kind of money that was ours. Oh, that's like a, a separate conversation. Um, but I think who is making the decisions of where that money goes? Who decides what transparency means? Who decides what accountability means? Who puts those processes in place for these organizations in the Commonwealth to report back to the Commonwealth? And who decides where the money goes? What funds and causes does it fund? And I think those decisions have to be made by us. And I think inherently all these institutions are headquartered in the UK, which in itself shows that there's kind of this top-down approach and we're almost served rather than taking decisions. So I think those would be kind of my three key action points, uh, which are very possible things to do. Um, so I think um, that's kind of how I envision this to be a reality in the next kind of year or so. Um, yeah. That's really interesting because Kavi, what you're really pointing to is not only the decentralization of power in this sort of like intangible amorphous thing, but also in the, the physical structures of these institutions, right? And having a real presence in regions, in countries so that people can actually directly engage and be within those spaces on a regular basis rather than um, in advisory roles in this sort of temporary and I guess short-term engagement in the process, right? And Lance, with given your position of, of leadership in the indigenous community, it would be great to hear from you um, about you know, what, what Kavi's just presented. Yeah, I think that was a you know really important um, subject there. And you know, the topic of decolonization is something that, you know, when we talk about what the Commonwealth can do and we consider the role the Commonwealth plays, you know, I think in terms of de decolonization across the 52 member states, um, I think it would be important if the Commonwealth as an organization um, would, you know, maybe after the Commonwealth heads of government meeting as part of a joint statement, you know, repudiates colonialism. And I think, you know, that would be a really important thing to do um, to ensure that we can move, you know, begin the process of moving beyond um, our colonial past. You know, one of our Indigenous leaders here in Canada talks about walking through the post-colonial door. So, you know, it's the concept of looking at, you know, where we are right now with colonialism, but what's beyond that door? And that's what our communities, that's what our people have to think about. You know, what will our countries, what will our communities look like post-colonialism?
Kembo, what, what do you think? What would you like to see Commonwealth institutions doing to decentralize power? Um, in, in the spirit of critical conversation, I would, I, I would like to, to really point out the, the, the idea of having so much funds um, being invested in, in trying to uh, build policies and, uh, um, and also, re I don't know, reinvent some of these policies. And yet, little is invested in actual action, right? Actual implementation of these policies. We see um, in the past that the Commonwealth has been very, very essential to development of policies. But then, uh, its its presence in implementation, its its impact in actual groundwork is is, is questionable. So, you find that. Uh, a lot of these this resources are going into feeding um, very, very, uh, very expensive meetings and very expensive gatherings to discuss more policies and more policies. But then the policies still don't make it back to the actual ground. Also to point out the, the relationship between um, the Commonwealth being, of course, a, a group of heads of states uh, in charge of it, uh, there is a lot of um, detachment from the actual citizens of the Commonwealth because you find that in countries like uh, Uganda and other African countries, probably in some other regions too, you find that the, uh, if resources are transferred from the Commonwealth to the governments, They actually don't make it to to the citizen. Sorry about that. Uh, but sorry about that. The internet went off a bit. Uh, so, like I was saying, the citizens don't really see the benefit. Rarely see the benefit of the Commonwealth, but rather. They, they just hear about the Commonwealth and what it's doing, but rather, but don't see the actual impact. So this is because most times in African states and in respect to critical conversations in this case, there's so much corruption, there's so much um, fraud and there's so much, and most of these resources keep getting lost on the way. So you find that we need to have Commonwealth institutions uh, finding ways to deal directly with uh, the Commonwealth citizens. And this is through the private sector. This is through the civil societies. And if we can have more, for example, a, a good example would be the Commonwealth Youth Awards. You find that the Commonwealth Youth Awards kind of uh, provide recognition and also resources to youth who are doing really good work. So if we can have the Commonwealth taking more of that approach, right, then going through the actual government, we will have more impact on ground than we have at the moment. Uh, that's my take. You raise an excellent point about, you know, going to meetings and discussing things and coming up with policy and looking at legislative change, but not actually getting it home. Or maybe it comes home, but it's never actually enacted. And I think this might connect with a lot of the questions that we're getting in right now around safety, security, and protection. So young people are at risk, you know, in some regions or countries more than others, but definitely at risk of violence against them, of victimization for speaking out and for participating very openly and boldly in these spaces. What do you want to see? Commonwealth institutions do to protect people in these positions? And I'm gonna to come to you first, Emmanuel. 
I'm not sure if I'm necessarily best placed to answer the first part of that question, just because I think my experience of um, violence is going to be different to others, perhaps. Um, but I certainly will address that the, the last part of the question, which is what do we want to see Commonwealth institutions to do? And I think my 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 lessons from community organizing and from the black radical tradition is to actually begin with a different question. And that is, instead of what do we want Commonwealth institutions to do, it's what do we want our world to be? What do we want our world to look like? And then how do our institutions work towards that change? And I, I say that because we have to start with the radical imaginations first. So what are we actually fighting for? Are we imagining a world without borders, a world without the prison industrial complex, without violence, without climate disaster, whatever it might be, we need to work with those radical imaginations at the forefront and then see how our institutions can actually support those aims. Because I think by starting with the institutions, we're sometimes falling into the trap of using a neoliberal uh, methodology to enact change that can't be necessarily done within the institutions themselves. Um, and I, I think it kind of goes back as well to the earlier conversation of inclusion. When we're talking about inclusion, it's not, we cannot just assume that just because someone is a woman or someone is queer or someone is black, that they are going to have the politics in mind that are going to actually support the identities that they come from. So for example, in the UK, we've had two women prime ministers, but their policies haven't supported women's issues. Um, so our, it, it, I really think it's about um, the politics and the change that we want to see in the world. Instead of diversity and inclusion, it's about equity and justice. And instead of reform or working within our institutions, it's about making our demands first and then bending our institutions if they are to be involved in that process at all towards working towards that towards our aims. Nandamiso, do you have thoughts on specific actions and protections that can be put in place by Commonwealth institutions that actively engage young people who might be at risk of you know, being detained, being arrested, or facing other forms of harassment and violence when they get back home? Thank you for that. I think um, if I could build on what Emmanuel was saying, um, a lot of these vulnerabilities occur when um, we fail to take um, into consideration the intersectionality of life, right? So with all the different layers that we represent in our one body, um, whether it's how you look in terms of color, you know, your sex or your gender identity, um, your background, your belief system, your ableism, these, the, the, the more brackets or the more boxes you tick in terms of those intersectionalities, depending on where you are, are going to expose you or are going to um, put you more at risk than they would in different circumstances, depending on where you are. In terms of how do we protect or how do we ensure that um, when people are speaking out outside of their home, they're able to find that safety within their home. The first thing I would say is, you know, regardless of what, what word one would give or what, what kind of protectionism one would offer, um, the realities on the ground are very different, you know, and, and the situations that one might be confronted with when they go home will be very different to what we may have even imagined would be the repercussions. So I think uh, the first thing that one has to tell themselves is if they are taking a stand and they are speaking out, uh, you have to do it with conviction and you have to do it almost uh, with, with the idea of knowing that um, it comes at a high cost and, and be willing to pay for it, um, come what may. And I think when we, when we look at the protectionism that should come from the Commonwealth system, I think there are so many charters and constitutions and treaties and so many things that are on paper that realistically um, if they are only symbolic, if when they are violated, and we've seen them in our lifetimes violated and nobody has been truly held accountable or countries know that there's no loss at hitting back at those who are speaking out against them or fighting for um, a better existence than the one that exists today. Uh, there's just not going to be any difference in how we handle the situation. I think 
rather than looking at all the things, and this is where I'm, I'm going to touch on what Emmanuel spoke of, um, she was talking about this, this, this idea of, of this imagining. Um, and I almost feel like we still have to go back to basics within the system, within these nations, there's still not a commonly held um, understanding of how we got here why there are so many injustices, why we are fighting against laws we never even wrote for ourselves and why we need to move past that. So I would almost say that the, the starting point for me would be um, almost a process of elimination of what has been done, how did it harm us? How can we move towards this imagined future um, that will build us up recognizing how we got to this present place. And from there, then we can start making the demands with them, then we can be better informed in terms of what kind of protectionism we want from um, this bigger body. Um, but also understanding that the protectionism shouldn't just come from a mother or a father body, it truly should come from within. It should be that if all of our countries, or if all of our societies have lived up to signing a document, that there should be repercussions and there should be some sort of hesitation when you know that you're violating those freedoms, those identities, those ways of expressionism. Um, so that would be my contribution on that. I also want to go back to what Emmanuel said, because it's such an important point, this, this question of the world that we actually want. And sometimes our imaginations are constrained by the reality that we know. And where we are now has been largely determined by our past, by a colonial past, the, you know, the legacy of colonialism. And it really takes creativity to be able to think outside of that. So I'm going to bring you in, Darion, because I know that you, you are a super creative in so many different areas. How do you think outside of what you already know and enable yourself to imagine something that has never existed before? So I like that question, Alicia. Um, one of the things I oftentimes share with people is that in order to, to think outside of the box, we have to already know what's inside the box. Right, because very often you have people who would say, all right, I'm thinking outside of the box, but it's already something that has been done and they're just reinventing the wheel. Um, so, so what I always tell people is that knowledge is power. So please, please, and I kind of beg young people enough, I beg you all, please, 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 read, 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 and read more. It is so essential and so important for us to always be reading and always be catching up to everything that has been happening, especially in decades past, right? Uh, and I see that as being the most important thing in terms of then forming your ideas to then expand beyond the box, right? I, aside from that, so reading is, is one part. And I, and I also know that, um, that another, another thing that we could probably venture into is our conversations. Talk, talk, and talk more. Talk with different people. Don't speak with the same people. Don't only talk to the people who are inside the room, who have some sort of power, and I put that in inverted commas, right, because power is relative. Um, have some sort of power that, that you deem necessary for your self-advancement. Move away from that level of selfish thinking, right, and move into conversations with people in different walks of life. People who are on the ground, people who are in grassroots organizations, people who have different ways of thinking than you. The only way to expand your mindset is to read and have conversations. It's as simple as that, but just in different areas and different fields, always expand and always be willing to learn. So always have that listening air on and be willing to listen and listen and listen. And I, I, I know firsthand that Kakembo, you know, I, I remember when I was, when I, we, were, we were at a meeting in, um, in London and I would just sit down and I would listen to him because I, I've, I've never been to Uganda, but I learned so much from just that, that conversation that I had there. Right. And I see that. And then from there, what did I do? I went on and I did some further reading on what he was talking about within the different areas. And I see that as being so essential and so important. And, and right now we have the technology at our hands. I can literally just Google search anything. It's right here. I can load it up, go into Google Scholar and look up articles. So take advantage of the resources that we have. But in order to think outside the box, you need to read more. You need to converse more. And then after that is when you start 
putting your, your ideas, your pen to paper, and, and um, coming up with the ideas that will really be different, unique, and blow everybody else out of this world, yeah? Thank you. I think those are some really great pointers, you know, going forward and being able to listen more and pay attention and, and think outside of the box that we already know. So I have a little challenge for all of the panelists, as well as the people who are participating in the chat. Uh, I want you to answer Emmanuel's question. What, what world do you want to live in? What does the future look like? And instead of answering this in a very broad way, I want justice, I want equality, think specifically about the issue closest to you. So we have a lot of questions coming in about what we need to do about climate change, um, what we need to do about gender equality. What are we going to do about radical inclusion of youth? So people in the chat, please share your ideas. We'll try to read some of them out. And panelists, I'm stalling a little bit to give you some time to think about what you want the future to look like. And I'm coming to Cabby first. Wow. That's when Alicia like throw off like this surprise bomb at you and you're just like, wow, that's such a good question. I have no, I don't have an answer that matches. But um, I think, I think for me, um, coming from like a design perspective, I think I always think of my ideal future, this idea of reimagination is so powerful. And I also think it's very political because you're trying to break away from these ways and frames of thinking and to reimagine what you want. And I think to have that agency to be able to even know what you want is something that's difficult for a lot of us to do. And that's something I've had to kind of recognize over time. And I think for me, my ideal future would be something where we are able to design that future for ourselves um, and a future where we have an equal say in how that future looks like, whether it's from simple things like how our roads have to be designed or how an intersection should change in like a junction in like our corner store or something like that, to how our classrooms need to change, to how um, our parliamentary processes need to change. Um, I wish we can come up with some way where the people who are impacted by it at the end of the day have a say in how these very everyday things are kind of redesigned. Um, I know it's a very process oriented vision for the future, but I think that's what I would like to see someday. Um, yeah. Lance, what about you? What, what do you want to see the future look like? And I'll add, what can, common, what can the Commonwealth do to support you in the creation of that future? No, well, again, thank you for the question. And I think, you know, again, I'm very optimistic seeing what's being done in all of our, you know, here in our Indigenous communities in Canada, there's a lot of young leaders who are, um, you know, thinking outside the box and, you know, coming up with these really innovative things. And, you know, as Darian says, you know, in order to think outside the box, you have to know what's inside the box. So I'm seeing that happening in our communities. Um, and our young people are not reinventing the wheel. We're coming up with real innovative solutions to move our communities forward uh, past colonialism and into a future where, you know, Indigenous peoples are benefiting from and fully involved in our country, our economic, our political systems as much as anyone else. Um, what I think the Commonwealth can do um, and, what can, and what you are doing right now is creating the space for Indigenous people, particularly Indigenous young people. Um, to have the opportunity to share our perspectives, to uh, contribute our voice to the things that are happening across the Commonwealth um, and ensure that, you know, people around the world are aware of the things, the good things that are happening in our country to move past our colonial history and into a future where, you know, Indigenous people are benefiting from, you know, all of the things that Canada and the Commonwealth has to offer. Hey, Kembo, can you tell us about your future and what you need to make it happen? Uh, yes, I, I would um, kind of like, I would be in line with uh, Kavi and uh, my, the future I would like to see would be more inclusion. Uh, it's simply more inclusion. Uh, if we can have more uh, of people who are affected by most of the issues, be brought to the table to actually tell them how to, to actually give their opinions on how this 
uh, challenges can be solved. Also, um, I would like to also look at the perspective of uh, funding uh, when it comes to Commonwealth. Uh, I would, I would, like I mentioned earlier, I would think a uh, change in strategy of how the Commonwealth uh, is trying to uh, push resources into uh, its member states. I would, I would recommend a change in approach to rather going through private, uh, private organization, private sector, and also civil society to ensure that these resources are accountably used. Yes, there are questions on the private sector, of course, and how uh, and its level of accountability. But uh, looking through our history, it has actually the private sector is being doing much better than. The, the governments uh, are doing. So uh, that's probably how I envision a better future. Also, um, in light of that, we have different Commonwealth youth networks within uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat. I would also uh, really, really encourage the Commonwealth Secretariat to actually uh, put, put more, um, more light into these networks and put more life into these networks because they can do a lot in, uh, in, in, in promoting youth inclusion within their different uh, spaces that they operate. Thank you. We have a great question from Nicholas Watts. So I'm gonna weave it in a little bit here um, for you, Nandamisu. Um, when you think about your future, the one that you want to create, what systems would you recreate within your own community, as well as within the Commonwealth? No pressure, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so I think the, the starting point for me would be to put the disclaimer that my background is obviously in international relations and policy. So I'm very passionate about looking at uh, systems and laws and, and treaties and agreements and in looking at what future I, I would like to have you know I have to start by looking at myself and, and acknowledging the fact that I am black I am African I am cisgendered um, and that in certain spaces that will be seen as a deficit even before I say anything and it's not right, it shouldn't be legal, it shouldn't be accepted, and more importantly, it shouldn't go unchallenged, whether it's on a national scale, uh, on a regional scale, or even within this Commonwealth block. Um, when I think of the systems that would need to change, uh, for me specifically, uh, there, there's certain anecdotes that one could share about how difficult it can be simply being a single black woman in this part of the world um, from the fact that for certain things you need to seek permission from your male relatives or you need to seek approval um, or share information with your spouse if you're going into business or you're opening a bank account and these are legal, these are still written into the laws of the country. Um, and so those are the first, those are the starting points for me that it shouldn't be okay that for me to progress in my life, I have to constantly seek from another and that other has to be a male relative or a male um, person in my life who's willing to sign on or um, endorse the path that I want to create for myself. Um, in terms of the Commonwealth supporting um, what future I may imagine, I'm, I'm a founder of a youth-led nonprofit organization. And this common phrase of youth are the leaders of tomorrow. They're not the leaders of tomorrow. We're here, we're, we're very present and we're very active on the issues that we see are pressing. We are innovating. We are responding to the issues of today. And to constantly minimize and make it seem like there's a distant future we should have our eye on 
is simply not fair and it's simply inaccurate and it's, it's quite condescending. So from any institution, um, be it national, be it regional, be it within a block, what I would ask is um, to truly engage us, to truly ask us what needs to be done and to partner with us with respect, whether it's in a funding situation, whether it's work on the ground, there are things that we will all be able to learn from one another, no matter who comes into the situation with this title of expert and this other title of uh, youth, to use blanket terms, we all have something that we could be learning from one another. Um, so I would say to all institutions, not just the Commonwealth, but for anyone involved in such systems, to really keep that in mind. And you, you brought up policy and you know, the issues with legislation that discriminates against women and girls. So I want to take it back to Emmanuel because this is the area that you specifically worked in. So I wonder if you can tell us about your future in terms of the need for legislative change and what, what you saw the Commonwealth do over the past couple of years since the statement of regret and what can actually be done better. I think the Commonwealth has a lot to offer in terms of bringing people to the table who wouldn't necessarily be able to communicate. Like this panel alone is, is honestly beautiful in, in the sense that I'm talking to people from across the world. I think that is amazing. Um, and I would say that the future that I imagine is based on a queer and feminist future. And that means bringing practices uh, of healing justice, for example, to um, to feminism, into our policies, into our ways of working, into our ways of living in this world. I think, yeah, we we our processes of imagination are still within um, very kind of patriarchal or um, closed lenses. And in order to genuinely imagine what could be, we need to actually stop bringing in the lessons from our elders from our queer leaders, from our women leaders and so on. And actually, you know, not, not shy away from bringing in discussions that we might find challenging. So talking about mental health, how can we bring the issue of mental health to the workplace um, and, you know, so on. There are so many ways that we can um, completely transform our institutions. Um, and as, as, uh, as has been said so powerfully, like in order for us to do that, we need to know what the ground that we're working on already is. We need to understand it in order to actually challenge it. Um, and that means talking about the, the challenges that we're, that we're fighting against in order to envision new futures. Thank you. Our time has just gone by so quickly. I feel like we could have stayed here and talked for hours and hours more, but I just have one more question for all of the panelists. And at you know the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting is coming up and it's a space where major issues are taken on and you, know, you can have an outcome document. So what, what are your demands for the Commonwealth and heads of governments to take on and to tackle at that meeting or what kinds of outcomes do you want to see from Chogum when it takes place? next year, specifically around youth, true youth engagement, and moving the Commonwealth towards the future that you imagine for yourself and, and for your community. Uh, so we'll go starting with Darion. Thanks a lot, Alicia. And I think that, um, that basically it ties into to also the outcomes that we have next year ties into my vision for the Commonwealth as a whole as well, um, which is one that's just simply discrimination free. And I think that discrimination is the, is the base of, of all our issues that we see within, within the entire Commonwealth, right? Um, and, and the issues that we, that we all face come from discrimination, racial injustice, gender injustice, um, class injustice, all of these things. And I feel as if the solution to this already um, as, as was mentioned by Nondumiso, uh, Kavi, Kakembo, Lance, Emmanuel, but I, I feel as if Lance will, will agree with me specifically here, is that the, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of, of how we move forward in terms of eradication, eradicating this, but that the indigenous groups and people already told us exactly what we need to do. If we go back to the core doctrine 
from the Zulus and the Yorubas in, in Africa and all the 3,000 other tribes to the Polynesians and Micronesians and, and Aboriginals in, in the Pacific to the indigenous people in Canada and the, and the Caribbean to the yogis and imams and, and, and pastors across the globe or yogis and imams in, in Asia. No matter where you go across the globe, at the core of every doctrine is always that idea of respect and love and unity for one another. And I feel as if that's so important. So I feel as if all our policies that, that we, that we um, come up with and that we engage in at the CYF should be anti-discriminatory, should be as inclusive. Thank you so much, Darion. Um, moving on to Kavi. Um, I think, uh, especially with Chogam, um, I, I really want to go back to what something that Kimba said, said that, you know, we keep like, there's so much budgets allocated for things like Chogam. Like I honestly look back at Chogam that happened in Sri Lanka and I was like, well, what happened? Like it was fun, like it looked nice, it looked fancy, but I think how can we even rethink conferences and the amount of money that we allocate for it, I think would be a really good conversation for Chogam to have. Um, is there a point in all of us coming together and talking, is there another way of doing this, of having that same level of engagement will be something that I would love for Chogam to talk about. Um, and also these ideas of the legal aspects of it that we're still suffering from laws from the British Empire that still um, impact our everyday lives and how we can undo them um, will be my Thank ask. Thank you. Lance? Well, thank you for that. Um, I think my ask of that would be, you know, we need our young people across the Commonwealth and especially Indigenous people to be empowered to, you know, do the hard work in our communities because it's really going to, um, you know, the people on the ground in the communities that are doing the hard work of, you know, capacity building of, you know, moving past that colonial door. So what the Commonwealth can do and what, again, what we're doing now is so important, having these discussions, young people coming together and coming up with a common vision for what a post-colonial uh, Commonwealth would look like. Thank you, Kakambo. Yes, um, Kavi took the words right out of my mouth. Um, yes, I also really think we need to revise the whole concept of um, these in how uh, in person meetings. Uh, if if I also look back at the program that happened in Uganda, there's so much money that got lost during that time. So much corruption. So much. And these are public funds, these are commonwealth funds that are, are just being directed to re literally no outcomes. And uh, I would also want to see real action coming out of the, 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 these commonwealth meetings because most of the times uh, these heads of states go there and they carry a team as old as time and then they sleep within the meetings, they do shopping, they, to be honest, if we are to talk uh, critical conversations, African leaders that attend Chogam just sleep in that, uh, in that meeting. So most of the time you find that whatever is discussed in Chogam doesn't even reflect until the next Chogam where they have to just revise what they say. Definitely need more, more focus and, and choosing the right people. Thank you so much. And Emmanuel. Uh, when talking about young people, I'm always reminded of a saying that um, essentially means like our present is a borrowing from future generations. And so I think I'd like to see Chogham bring a tangible, financial, more than just symbolic commitment to abolition, reparation and liberation. Thank you. And really quickly, Nandamisu. I would say we would have to have an audit and a reevaluation of the Commonwealth Charter through youth eyes. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. Please give your final wave before you turn your video and audio off. Um, in the chat, please share all the love for the, for the panel. And thank you so much for your very full participation. This has really been an amazing conversation and I'm so glad that all of you joined us for it. Uh, I remembered about halfway through, as I always do, that I did not introduce myself. So I'm Alicia Wallace. I am from the Bahamas, and it has been my pleasure to moderate this conversation with these amazing young people. 
And I'm really looking forward to how we move this conversation forward. I know there were tons of comments and questions that we didn't get to. Please continue the conversation on social media. You should have all the handles. They've been provided in the chat. And we invite you to attend the next critical conversation. I know that after attending this, you know that you don't want to miss it. It is on January 26th. And please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.